welcome patrons. I'm Matt Leck. With me as always, David Griscom. Hello, David. Hey, man. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, I, uh, I'm, you know, I like the sort of reading uh, uh, series we're doing. We're going to go way back to the very beginning of, uh, of our boy, Le Jeune Karl Marx, as the, uh, that <laughs> French movie, The, the Young yeah. Karl Marx. Um, and this is kind of apropos, I think, given our conversation about Christopher Hitchens with Ben Burgess. Uh, you know, we played some Hitchens and we'll play a little clip of him talking about a quote from this uh, section of mm. Marx. Uh, what what is interesting to me is you know Marx's um, general gist here is focusing too much on ideas, particularly the religious ideas here, and we need to focus about you know material reality, mm. and that's something you know just to contrast uh, with Hitchens, it's like he sort of went the other way. <laughs> He's like, we'll do some of this materialism stuff, and then let's get really into the ideas. And uh, and I think it was worse for it. I mean, I had, I was looking through my old Hitchens tweets the other night, and I, in between the one where I confessed to having a dream about Hitchens, I also said like we wasted a lot of or like it, it was a shame basically that we had to waste so much of his time, you know, faffing about talking about if God exists or not. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but anyway, Marx did not make that uh, mistake, and uh, that's why he uh, lives on. Um, but uh, yeah, what do you have to say about uh, uh, today? We're talking about, I should say, a criticism yeah. of Hegel's philosophy of right. Uh, it's the introduction to uh, th this uh, this critique, um, not the whole thing. But uh, yeah, this is where the famous opiate of the masses uh, quotation is from. I mean, this is a, a definitely a very interesting and important text. It wasn't published during Marx's life, but it's a it's one that a lot of people return to. I think the first time it was published was might have been like in like the 19th in like the early 1920s or something like that. Um, right. But it ends up. Yeah. Becoming... I just want to say one note on like this th th crazy thing about Marx stuff is, yeah, a lot of it wasn't published in English until like the twenties or thirties. Yeah. And then at that point, they, you're not really able to, it wasn't really digested until the post-war, um, which is very interesting. Though I would argue that like this, um, this stuff is very present in, in Marx's work. And in fact, like the reason that a lot of people, especially people who study the philosophy and particularly Marx um, are interested in this text and another couple of texts that we might do, you know, in the next couple months or a few weeks um, on the Jewish question are, are very um, crucial along with the German ideology, because they sort of represent this break um, that Marx has with idealism um, in his shift to like creating what ends up becoming Marxism and, and, and the philosophy that he's starting to develop here, it's not complete and there'll be some revisions and, um, you know, it, it's been a long time since I've gone through all of these. So, um, you know, I won't be able to point all of them out or anything like that, but, um, you know, he, he's sort of like, this is him starting to break from the young Hegelians, um, who is a group of people who are following in, in the kind of teachings of, of Hegel, um, who truly found and, and thought that like the role of philosophy and the role of the philosopher is to do things like critique the absurdity of the system. That's not the wording that they would use, but like, you know, critique religion, critique, um, you know, the irrational parts of society, basically creating this version of, uh, you know, of an enlightened society um, through the power of like reason and, and rationality in and of themselves, right? Which is a very idealist kind of conception of, of, of history. And um, Marx flips this um, in this text and, and later on. So instead of, um, you know, yeah, I mean, he, he flips this kind of conception of saying that like, um, to change the um, to change society, we need to change the ideas. Marx actually flips it to saying, if we want to change the ideas, we have to change society. Um, and this is him beginning um, that the argument was so very very interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, Hegel is one of those thinkers that uh, some people get really really into and spend their entire life reading and thinking about. Some people have a very very um, you know, spark notes version understanding of Hegel. Um, I don't think necessarily, at least for this text, getting too worked up um, about um, drawing out like Hegel himself from this. I'm just saying if as a casual reader to get Marx's point, you don't have to get super fixated on the Hegel stuff. As long as you sort of understand this is the distinction here is moving from that kind of idealist conception to a materialist one. Yeah. Just some, uh, a few, I guess, um, more contextual notes. Um, yeah, he met a lot of the young Hegelians in law school and Berlin University. Um, Berlin University was uh, founded um, 
Alexander von Humboldt, big enlightenment explorer type naturalist guy uh, in the wake of Napoleon washing them and saying, okay, we need some uh, secular structures to help, you know, create a civil society. And that's where Berlin Uni University comes from. Uh, mm. He gets exposed to Hegel, uh, you know, that's about 30 years, uh, 20, well, I guess, yeah, 30 years or so into that university existing by uh, a guy who worked with Hegel, a uh, sort of uh, assistant to him. I don't know how to exactly characterize it, but Edward Gans. And he's his teacher at Berlin University. And you know, Gans worked with uh, Hegel. Uh, he was Jewish, Gans was, and had to basically um, convert to maintain his place in society, which is wow. similar to what happened in Marx's uh, biography to his father. Uh, we'll touch more on that when we do on the Jewish question. But you see like that why religion is such a fixation right now right like this is mm -hmm. serious serious like you talk about like islamophobia and the new atheists which is the you know modern uh, corollary to what when i think of this when i think of the young hegelians that you know too fixated on the ideas of religion themselves um th it was obviously you know ex extreme there the one other note is you know um napoleon comes to power uh, actually actually i have a, a section here from it's a book called uh, Marx. A uh, revolutionary, um, uh, Karl Marx philosophy and revolution. Uh, this is from uh, Yale uh, University Press's Jewish Live series, so it's particularly sensitive to uh, uh, this part of stuff. And uh, I, uh, that's why I went to for the on uh, Jewish question background. But um, he writes, revolutionary France was the first European country to emancipate its Jews, granting them equal political and civil rights. When it annexed the Rhineland, this emancipation was extended to Jews there as well. Um, and basically, long story short, Napoleon gets uh, comes to an end, uh, and the restoration of sort of aristocratic power in uh, Europe puts those Jews back in their place, saying mm -hmm. you can't have any position of authority over a Christian and unless you convert. And so that's where a lot of these conversions uh, came from. But yeah, so um, anything else before we uh, get into the text here? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to front load things too much, but I do think um, that sort of going through like uh, just briefly like ideology and like the Marxist conception later might help people sort of grasp at what's being talked about here because you can get sort of lost in the in the history that marx is talking about he talks about the the history of germany and also uh religion um but let me think about this it's like marx um you know is with these kind of young hegelians who as you were saying earlier think that if you critique the ideas we can change the society right if, if we change the ideas um if we dispel the myths um we can we can break um, you know, the, these change and Marx very much disagrees with that. Um, as, as we'll get to, he, he speaks very poetically about, you know, criticism just plucks away the flowers from the chains that people, um, where if we want to change that, we need to break, um, the chains themselves. Right. Like maybe to think about this is like, think about the way that, um, you know, the illusions that we all sort of like live with, like, this is what ideology is, right. It, it, it helps us orient the world. And a lot of people, um, especially in America, I think they, when they hear the word ideology, they think about it like, oh, you have a liberal ideology or a conservative ideology or a Marxist ideology, right? Um, that's not really ideology in the sense that Marx and Marxists use it. Ideology is the set of ideas that emanate from the ruling class that sort of order the world around us, right? Um, and it doesn't actually matter if you dispel like the, 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 um, you know, the ideas themselves. Let me give you an example that everybody does when they're stoned or hanging out with people um, is they talk about money, right? Money is an illusion, right? You know, yeah. from hippies to like right wingers, everyone has had that conversation at some level, right? And with the general critique of money, that's, oh, it only has value because we say it has value, man. You know, we could be using seashells or something else. It's like, that's actually very true, right? Um but just changing the way that you think about it in that sense doesn't change anything because you know what happens the moment, even if, if you convince everybody around you of this, right? The moment that you leave that room or seminar, the salon, the bar, whatever, coffee shop that you're at, you're going to go and you're going to buy food with money, pay your rent with money and work for money, right? So even if you feel one way about it, um, you know, the way society is structured, the way the material the way production is structured in this society necessitates that we believe in money, 
right? Even if we have a bad faith um, relationship to it, um, right. you need that, right? So, you know, understanding that um, at, when we're talking about ideology, I think is, is really important. And two, it's like, like we need ideology. Um, like ideology is produced to help us understand, um, you know, the, the world around us to order a very, very complicated, all these complicated relationships that we have, um, this complicated society that we have. So it's like a lot of times when people get into like that kind of like big M Marxist conception of ideology, it's like they think of it like in a kind of Buddhist way, right? Where it's like, I'm going to transcend like the illusion myself, right? And I'm going to transcend ideology. And again, um, you know, that might be very well for you in, in, in your own personal journey. Um, but like the real onus of, of philosophy in Marxist term, um, and, and he writes this at the end of his um, his 11 theses on Feuerbach, is that like the point of philosophy is to change the world, right? Rather than interpret it. Um, so this is just like a really, really big point. It's something that I think a lot of non-Marxists and fellow travelers on the left, like really, really struggle with. Um, and this is just an exciting text because this is like where you can really start to, to hone in on Marx building out this, this theory, which I think is, you know, just as crucial in a lot of ways as the work that he does later, um, the more political economy version of, of Marx capital, et cetera. Um, the ideology I think is, is very, very, um, crucial. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, this sort of, it, it, it really is like the what is it? He stared Hegel on his head or whatever. Yeah, so um, he put Hegel and, on his head. But it, that I mean, I even you know I, I talk about this all the time. But reading um, Marx for it was German ideology. But this sort of like mm. move where it's like, yeah, it's not about the like um, idea. It's not about idealism, right? <laughs> like the, the, you need to understand like what what's projecting what and where you know what. Like the root of things, right? Um, I, I don't know. I think it's really no. Good. Of course, and, and and the point is not because also like you know this is not some kind of just like agno like we should be agnostic about moral, religious, philosophical questions. Yeah. It's it's that if you are somebody who wants to change things, right? Like the young Hegelians did, they saw that there are a lot of like German society was backwards, right? I mean, they were progressives. Um, yeah in that in that sense right i mean not perfect obviously but like they're progressive in the sense that they thought history was going a certain way and they wanted to move it forward um you know in, into a further stage of advancement and um the point is not that we you know that like taking those questions seriously is wrong right um but that if you're serious about in, engaging in that project you need to get to the actual root cause which is the material conditions and and, and, and production um so again, just to say it like very plainly, the problem with the, the, the criticism, at least of idealism, is not that they spent time thinking about philosophy or criticizing, for example, the Bible or like, you know, theology or, or um, you know, feudalism for, for God's sakes. Um, that's not the problem. It's just that they think that the critique in and of itself is what is going to change things um, rather than um, actual uh, materials changes to the society that those ideas come out of, right? Like that's another thing too, is like ideology does not just like fall from the sky, right? We create it. Um, right. And, uh, I mean, we, we're going to go through this pretty in depth, so we don't need to say it 10 different ways before we go in. But I just think that at least for me, this is like the big key of the text. And I think going into it with that understanding will help you help us orient ourselves especially because we're not going to do the entire text we're doing some selections from it yep here's uh but we will do a, a extended uh section on the opening and uh that's what mm -hmm. we got right here for you this is audible formative early writings by Karl marx read by derek lepage for ukemi audiobooks A criticism of the Hegelian <laughs> philosophy of right. Love me an audiobook. By Karl Marx. <laughs> Translated by H. J. Stenning. As far as Germany is concerned, the criticism of religion is practically completed, and the criticism of religion is the basis of all criticism. The profane existence of error is threatened when its heavenly oratio pro aris et focus, speech in defense of hearths and homes, 
has been refuted. He who has only found a reflection of himself in the fantastic reality of heaven where he looked for a superman will no longer be willing to find only the semblance of himself, only the subhuman, where he seeks and ought to find his own reality. What I also appreciate about this text is how sort of new the few the revolutions over feudalism seem, right? Like this is mm -hmm. what we're talking about where like God's representatives, we no longer believe in that shit about kings. <laughs> and yeah. so who is, who is, who gets to be the sort of divine author of like, you know, creation and production on earth. And that's it. Yeah. The, the, we haven't mastered that shift yet. The foundation of the criticism of religion is man makes religion. Religion does not make man. Religion indeed is man's self-consciousness and self-estimation while he has not found his feet in the universe. But man is no abstract being squatting outside the world. Man is the world of men, the state, society. This state, this society, produces religion, which is an inverted world consciousness, because they are an inverted world. Religion is the general theory of this world, its encyclopedic compendium, its logic in popular form, its spiritualistic point d'honneur, its enthusiasm, its moral sanction, its solemn compliment, its general basis of consolation and justification. It is the fantastic realization of the human being inasmuch as the human being possesses no true reality. The struggle against religion is therefore indirectly the struggle against that world whose spiritual aroma is religion. Religious misery is in one mouth the expression of real misery, and in another is a protestation mm. against real misery. Religion is the moan of the oppressed creature, the sentiment of a heartless world, as it is the spirit of spiritless conditions. It is the opium of the people. I mean, can we pause it there? Um, yep. As you know, and of course we have the the Hitchens, um, you know, ex explanation here as well. Um, but this is a very, very obviously famous line. The last bit: it, 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 religion is the opium of the people. And again, um, you know, there's the ellipsis that are always there when you see it because that's not the direct quotation. Um, and in the longer version. Um, it has a lot more meaning, right? It's not just more poetic, but there's more meaning here in the sense um, that this is a, you know, a protest in a way of, of the current conditions, right? It, it is the heart of this heartless world. It, it means that religion was something that was produced to fill in these kind of human gaps, right? To make it okay for us to struggle and suffer um, you know, through the feudal era and then through the early um, kind of very violent, um, you know, in invasions of, uh, you know, of the commons that happened in early capitalism, right? You know, and, and there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time working on this, but the idea is essentially is that, you know, a big part of, you know, the Protestant um, philosophy and, and, and theology, particularly in Germany, is this idea that you um, may not be rewarded in this life um, for the work that you were doing, but by continuing to, you know, hold on to these values of hard work, keeping your nose down and, you know, and, and not making a big fuss, you will be rewarded, um, in the afterlife. Um, and this ends up, you know, this can become a very, very powerful motivation for people if nothing else, um, a, you know, a solace for you to hold to yourself that like, oh, my life is very difficult and it doesn't look like I have many prospects for it getting better. And instead of rising up or, or, or challenging that system itself, you say, well, in the eternal kingdom that goes on way beyond this world, um, I will be I will be free and, and, and be happy in heaven. Absolutely, yeah. Should we play the Hitchens uh, right at this moment? Might as well. Yeah, well, why not? It's good. Um, I'll correct him also on another point. Very common misapprehension. And I'll try and demonstrate in doing so that we are not on this side deaf to the numinous, as it were. It is flat out not true to say that Karl Marx referred to religion as an opiate or an opium. What he says, I can quote it from memory, 
from his uh, uh, contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right is this. He says, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, the spirit of the spiritless situation. It is an opiate for the sufferer, for the people. So he goes on to say, the demand to give up its illusion is the demand to give up the condition that requires illusions. And he mm. closes by saying that criticism has plucked the flowers from the chain. Not so that men and women may wear the chain without consolation, but so that they may break the chain and cull the living flower. Now, that, the fact that you've been lied to about what he said all this time by, by religious spokesmen shouldn't... Uh, conceal from you the knowledge that we have a, a very clear understanding of where this impulse comes. I actually don't like the Sistine Chapel. I didn't like it, I didn't like it even before I knew that every brick of St. Peter's was raised by the sale of indulgences, which obviously... Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I mean, this is, this is a very critical point too, right? Because, you know, just to make it clear, I mean, what he's accusing, um, you know, the, his his opponents there and in general of doing with that quote is basically saying, like, you know, the atheists are being curmudgeons and saying we're going to take away like a nice and beautiful and meaningful thing from you. Um, again, like the, the, that quote is very explicit. And, you know, the, um, you know, I love the line and the imagery of like, we're just taking the flowers off of the chain so that we can see the chain and, and, and break it. Right. So again, it's not about taking away people's like, you know, faith just out of some kind of cruel exercise to, you know, to, to take away comfort from people. Um, it's trying to change the conditions themselves that required us, um, you know, to create these, these kind of, you know, ideas and stories and, and, and religion to sort of comfort us um, in, in a very cruel world, again, that is by our own creation, right? One that can be created and, and, and remade in a different fashion. Yep. Oops. They're stationed against real misery. Religion is the moan of the oppressed creature, the sentiment of a heartless world, as it is the spirit of spiritless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion, as the illusory happiness of the people, is the demand for their real happiness. The demand to abandon the illusions about their condition is a demand to abandon a condition which requires illusions. The criticism of religion therefore contains potentially the criticism of the veil of tears whose aureole is religion. Criticism has plucked the imaginary flowers which adorned the chain. Not that man should wear his fetters denuded of fanciful embellishment, but that he should throw off the chain and break the living flower. The criticism of religion disillusions man, so that he thinks acts shapes his reality like the disillusioned man come to his senses, so that he revolves around himself and thus around his real son. Religion is but the illusory sun which revolves around man, so long as he does not revolve around himself. It is therefore the task of history, once the other world of truth has vanished, to establish the truth of this world. The immediate task of philosophy, when enlisted in the service of history, is to unmask human self-alienation in its unholy shape, now that it has been unmasked in its holy shape. Thus the criticism of heaven transforms itself into the criticism of earth, hmm. the criticism of religion into the criticism of right, and the criticism of theology into the criticism of politics. The following essay... That's, a, that's I mean, I think that that's really important. Of Hegel's um, philosophy. Gotcha. You know, I think that that's like an important line right there too. And I love yeah. the line too. It's like the criticism of heaven turns itself into the criticism of earth. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is like the secondary project, which again, you never see, um, not to focus too much on them, but from the new atheists, right? Um, it truly is. Um, if we were rid of the, these ideas, then we would be, you know, living in a, in a better world. And that again, um, 
while those things are used as 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 tools, right? One to like, I also think it's worthwhile to to note too. Um, you know that religion is not only used in the sense of uh, you know placating and 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 giving comfort to folks. It also gives people authority over you. Um, so this is how you know, and this is where this kind of criticism goes from the heavens back down to earth and and back right. into politics, right? you know, you see why this is being used in the way that it is to then help us see the way that our, our society and, and, and um, yeah, our system is structured. And anybody with any sort of awareness of just say, even the West and the experience with the Bible uh, would know even the Bible itself has, you know, many different books written from different perspectives by different mm -hmm. people and different, like, you know, some are written mainly like for like Kings and stuff like that. And, you know, but like, that thing where there's there's something where we all decided of course powerful people get to determine meaning from these things more than others but it has to have some buy-in from regular people right and that's where you see mm -hmm. during like the, the the reformation and all like the english civil war stuff is you have people quoting the bible to get rid of private property and mm -hmm. you have also people quoting the bible to maintain private property right like it's just like that and part of the reason it's the Bible is because it had that kind of elasticity that could speak to so many people. And uh, I'm frankly sure that's true of basically any uh, holy text. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Oops, one second. So now we're sort of moving a little bit ahead, aren't we? Yes, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead to uh, we're talking um, still about uh, criticism and uh, consciousness raising sort of stuff. Moreover, as one shouts into the wood, so one's voice comes back in answer, <laughs> as the question, so the answer. Therefore, peace to the Teutonic primeval woods. But war to German conditions at all events. They lie below the level of history. They are liable to all criticism, but they remain a subject for criticism just as... Just to uh, go over what we what I skipped there, he's talking about ge the Germans' um, particular point in history, where you know, uh, right next to France, who had their uh, revolution and stuff like that. So just why Germany's a little bit behind, so they're stuck philosophizing instead of doing, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of like I guess what Marx is saying: humanity in general, sort of doing with capitalism. As the criminal who is below the level of humanity remains a subject for the executioner grappling with them criticism is no passion of the head it is the head of passion it is no anatomical knife it is a weapon its object is its enemy which it will not refute as someone who uh, reads a lot of history um i uh, that, that's why i'm i definitely like it's a weapon uh, i love that mm -hmm. I th actually that's History is a weapon. That's the uh, Chrisman does that with a um, as a worker. Sean from uh, Antifada. I'm just realizing oh, that's, that's awesome. where that got, they got that from. So I, this is me talking to people in the future, but we're going to post the uh, the link to the Marxist.org version of this text, and it is funny sometimes the the translations are you know very close, but uh huh. They're a little off. Um, I don't I'm know. Like in, yeah, it is not a lancet. It, it is a weapon. Is the last line. Um, its object is its enemy, which it wants not to refute, but it, to exterminate anyway. They're not, it, well, it doesn't change the meaning very much, but it's always a little striking to see which ones are yeah. more poetic than the other. Right. Loot, but destroy. For the spirit of the conditions has been refuted. In and for themselves, they are no memorable objects, but existences as contemptible as they are despised. Criticism has already settled all accounts with this subject. It no longer figures as an end in itself, but only as a means. Its essential pathos is indignation. Its essential work is denunciation. What we have to do is to describe a series of social spheres, all exercising a somewhat sluggish pressure upon each other, a general state of inactive dejection, a limitation which recognizes itself as much as it misunderstands itself. Sounds like uh, the woke mob and uh, the Biden administration. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Um, denunciation and <coughs> is that what he's is he outlining basically like you know class politics theory of history there like when we talk about different we have to outline different groups um i forget what he exactly says yeah um again and this is one of those things where my text is a little bit different but um yeah like this is what it says on my end it says the dull reciprocal pressure of all social spheres one on another a general inactive ill humor a limitedness which recognizes itself much as it mistakes itself right and this is you know kind of this is dialectics and again this is something that marx gets from hegel and and then sort of um mm. reforms particularly um the the shift and that's why we call it dialectical materialism um toward the way when we're looking at at production and to class struggle versus the kind of the struggle of ideas um which would be more of the hegelian understanding right so this is why we're moving more toward the social spheres um and understanding those squeezed within the framework of a governmental system which living on the conservation of all meannesses is itself nothing less than meanness in government what a spectacle on the one hand the infinitely ramified division of society into the most varied races which confront each other with small antipathies bad consciences and brutal mediocrity and precisely because of the ambiguous and suspicious positions which they occupy towards each other such positions being devoid of all real distinctions although coupled with various formalities are treated by their lords as existences on sufferance and even more the fact that they are ruled governed and owned they must acknowledge and just going to speed it up one click mainly yeah, copyright fine. copyright algorithm but um... confess as a favor of heaven on the other hand there are those rulers themselves whose greatness is in inverse proportion to their number hmm. The criticism which addresses itself to this object is criticism in hand-to-hand -hand fighting and in hand-to-hand -hand fighting it is not a question of whether i just got another section from this um uh shlomo avaneri uh book that i cited earlier um but this is just this is the context a little bit of context um for mm -hmm. uh this and um uh on the jewish question but uh, i'll just read here um, both serve as theoretical foundation for his call for a revolutionary overthrow of the existing social system by the proletariat. But nobody would guess this from the rather anodyne titles he gave uh, to the essays. There's moments like this one where you can feel it like really bubbling up. Mm -hmm. um, but the essay is like toward a critique of Hegel's philosophy on the right. Um, it is reasonable to assume that by hiding his radical call for a revolutionary social uh, and political transformation, Marx hoped to avert the eyes of customs and censorship officials. Uh, the collection was printed in Paris with the intent of smuggling it across the Rhine into Germany. If this was mm. the uh, uh, reason behind giving such a quasi-academic title to what were in fact revolutionary treatises, it failed. Most of the copies were confiscated by Prussian custom officials and only a few reached readers in Germany. Uh, for all the importance of the two essays uh, in Marx's own intellectual development, uh, it was basically hardly known at the time. Um, I just thought that was interesting. This is a, this another, you know, we talk about all these guys talking about censorship. You never hear like Jordan Peterson be like, you know, you can't <laughs> stop this idea in Marx's, uh, uh, you know, critique of Hegel. <laughs> you got all ideas. You got to let it out. Yeah, you let ideas bring it in. And Ruben's like, ooh, this idea. Ooh, I love ideas that are censored by the powers that be. Yum, yum. It's weird they never get around to this sort of stuff. We'll just rebrand Marx as the world's most canceled man. And this <laughs> guy will be joining the Communist Party in a moment. It is funny. They always do try to cancel him for the personal stuff, too, like immediately. It's, yeah. It's, you know, it's the way you treat his mom and stuff. Uh, the opponent is a noble opponent of equal birth or an interesting opponent. It is a question of meeting him. It is thus imperative that Could the Germans should have no. Yeah. I'm sorry, not to be a stickler. Like that. Uh, that I'm. I'm just going to reread that last sentence again in in the tr translation that's on Marxist.org because it's just I think much more to the point. Right. Criticism dealing with this content is criticism in a hand to hand fight, and in such a fight, the point is not whether the opponent is a noble, equally inter interesting opponent. The point is to strike him. Exactly. Just want to make sure people aren't missing that. Like, that's pretty blunt. I feel like it gets a little muted in the. 
that translation. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean that this is the um, this is the public domain translation here. That so that explains why that a little bit. To their number. The criticism which addresses itself to this object is criticism in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and in hand-to-hand -hand fighting it is not a question of whether the opponent is a noble opponent of equal birth or an interesting opponent. It is a question of meeting him. It is thus imperative that the Germans should have no opportunity for self-deception and resignation. The real pressure must be made more oppressive by making men conscious of the pressure, and the disgrace more disgraceful by publishing it. Every sphere of German society. So this is why when you see um, establishment apologists like Steven Pinker do startups uh, that are like trying mm -hmm. to spread the good news, all the good news that's getting, you know, uh, overwhelmed by just people's mm -hmm. incessant negativity. Like that's that's why, you know, those sorts of folks like that stuff. You know, we just need to focus on just positivity. And look at this cop gave this kid a bike with train wheels. Um, you know, look how, you know, nice society is. Just relax. Yeah, and I, I think that's that, that's a really good point. It's like, yeah, exactly. It's like we're pointing out the rot of this entire system, and it doesn't matter if, like, you know, and yes, the, this is our opponent, and like they might have very nice clothes and like some, you know, some things that are admirable, but uh, no, that they are our opponent. We have to we have to strike them. That's the point of, of criticism in this work. Yeah, party <laughs> must be described as the party honteuse, shameful part of German society. These petrified conditions must be made to dance by singing to them their own melody. The people must be taught to be startled at their own appearance in order to implant courage into them. Hmm. And even for modern nations, this struggle against the narrow-minded actuality of the German status quo cannot be without interest, for the German status quo represents the frank completion of the ancien regime and the ancien regime is the concealed defect of the modern state. Yeah, so uh, we'll skip over a little bit more where he goes into Germany being basically a little bit behind everything. Um, go on. No, no, I mean, I, I think that, that sounds good. I, I just like, I, I want to get this. I'm just going to read this out loud for people, which is the next sentence, just so people um, – can follow the, the point here because this I think puts a, a you know a point to it. The struggle against the German political present is the struggle against the past of the modern nations, and they are still burdened mm. with reminders of that past. It is instructive for them to see this um, ancient regime, uh, which has been through its tragedy with them, playing its comedy as a German revenant. Tragic indeed was the pre-existing power of the world and freedom, and on the other hand, was a personal notion. In short. As long as it is believed and had to believe in its own justification, as long as the ancient uh, the ancient regime as an existing world order struggled against a world that was only coming into being, um, there was on its side a historical error, not a personal one. That is why its downfall um, was tragic. And we're going to skip ahead a little bit. I just want people to be able to follow this thread. I mean, part of what he's explaining here um, is these kind of combinations of um, you know, modern societies and modern to their time uh, with these kind of more older feudal systems. And in, in Germany, it becomes very, very strange. And again, he'll explain this more later, but I just, in case anyone's not yeah. really following what this is. Um, um, in, in Germany, it's even more peculiar because, uh, you know, they didn't really have the same kind of revolution as other of, of, of their neighbors and contemporaries did, right. uh, which which creates some strange, um, I don't know, growing pains might be too blunt, uh, too like broad of a term, but like some very strange uh, creations in the system that they have now. Um, but as he'll note later, even though you can point them out and be like, oh, that's antiquated or, oh, that's, you know, inefficient understanding that those are also necessary conditions for the people. And in that point is the, you know, an extension of the monarchy, um, you know, to maintain their power um, means that they have to have all of these kind of um, absurd kind of uh, more older forms of, of, of government and, and tradition and law um, in, in, in their system. Yeah. It's, it's really, he, he goes in for Germany and talks about stuff you would, kind of expect more from the economic writings which is like 
now Germany's looking at needing a monopoly phase as yes. these other uh, nations are leaving theirs or like that, that, that their experiment is, you know, reaching a, a level of maturity and Germany's well, like theorizing about doing it themselves. And doing it on a national level. So like in the, in, in the context of the other nations, it's like they're trying to stop the monopolies from happening, but because of the way that German capitalism developed, the German state is like, we need to have national monopolies to like help us modernize and, and, and grow our power. Right. So that's a, that's a, that's intention to the development of capitalism in, in France and England in particular at that time. Yeah. And so it will come, come in again. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll get a little bit of the Germans on this on this one here. Or only satisfies the whole of man in an imaginary manner. Germans have thought in politics what other peoples have done. Germany was their theoretical conscience. The abstraction and arrogance of her thought always kept an even pace with the one-sidedness and stunted growth of her actuality. If, therefore, the status quo of the German civic community expresses the completion of the Ancien Regime, the completion of the pile driven into the flesh of the modern state, the status quo of German political science expresses the inadequacy of the modern state, the decay that is set up in its flesh. As a decisive counterpart of the previous mode of German political consciousness, the criticism of speculative jurisprudence does not run back upon itself, but assumes the shape of problems for whose solution there is only one means, practice. The question arises, can Germany attain to a practice à la hauteur de principe, that is, to a revolution which will not only raise her to the level of modern nations, but to the human level which will be the immediate future of these nations. The weapon of criticism cannot in any case replace the criticism of weapons. Material force must be overthrown by material force. But theory too becomes a material force as soon as it grasps weapons. Mm. Theory is capable of grasping weapons as soon as its argument becomes ad hominem. And its argument becomes ad hominem as soon as it becomes radical. To be radical is to grasp the matter by its root. Now the root for mankind is man himself. The evident proof of the radicalism of German theory, and therefore of its practical energy, is its outcome from the decisive and positive abolition of religion. The criticism of religion ends with the doctrine that man is the supreme being for mankind and therefore with the categorical imperative to overthrow all conditions in which man is a degraded, servile, neglected, contemptible being, conditions which cannot be better described than by the exclamation of a Frenchman on the occasion of a projected dog tax. Poor dogs, they want to treat you like men. <laughs> Even historically, <laughs> theoretical emancipation... So, Marx is very, like... It's funny, the reputation, I think, because people dive into capital, maybe, mm -hmm. um, but very funny uh, uh, and like or not just funny, but like a vivid writer. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and he's having fun with it. I mean, as we we're saying earlier, it's like, you know, he was uh, that, that metaphor he had or it's like, you know, the in a fist fight, you know, the point is not to like admire how noble and interesting your opponent is. The point is to hit them. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, that's that's on point. I mean. Uh, I, I do think we should at least uh, note on that that you know review a little bit of that section because I think that that's a very strong mm -hmm. um, bit. It is interesting too, like translation differences here, um, where he says you know theory has become a material force, and I think it says something around there as, as soon as it's gripped the root. Um, it was I think what the what it said as soon in, as it uh, wasn't it when it grabs weapons. Yeah, weapons, and he says weapons twice. Um, but in the first, in in the my translation, I don't know which one is more accurate either. Uh -huh. um, but um, in in this one, he he says you have to grab the weapon. So he says that it's grabbing a weapon. Um, but then he, it also flips weapon to masses. So instead of saying weapon twice, he says you have to. Criticism becomes this weapon, and um, theory becomes a material force as soon as it has gripped the masses. 
right? That's a instead of weapons. I mean, that's yeah. a big difference. I, I agree. So I do wonder what the original is because that would settle a lot, but that that certainly changes a lot of the meaning. Um, but you know, again, it's like going. You have to get to to the root um, of 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 the matter here, right? You have to get to where these things emanate from, and this replacing. And this is again like. You know, this is where this kind of tension, and I think some people get confused between like the Marxist criticism of religion, the young Hegelian uh, criticism of religion, and then like the new atheist um, criticism of, of religion get a little bit mixed up. And let's just follow closely what, what Marx is saying here. It's like once we um, eradicate this idea that, you know, that that there is, you know, this this other kind of divine plan for the universe, and in fact, you know, man is the the creator of, of religion, then we become, um, you know, the highest essence, right? The highest thing that we can aspire to be. Um, and then it puts it upon us. This is a categorical imperative um, to overthrow all of the relations that exist where we are debased and, you know, enslaved and abandoned, right? So wherever, I mean, and, you know, in, in a way this goes to some of the arguments that folks make like Ben and, and, and myself and Harvey and, and other folks, it's like, you know, socialism is is um, is fundamentally a philosophy of, of freedom, right? Like these systems that debase and enslave us um, and, and and trample on our essence, it's like that's that's capitalism. I mean, that's, you know, the line later is like, you know, we, we turn ourselves essentially in, in, into machines, right? Human beings become extensions of the, the production uh, process instead of, you know, endpoints in and of themselves, you know, humankind. Um, so wherever you see that you have to challenge it. And again, like Marx is going to continue like on this journey, but you can see this is how he's thinking. Um, anything that is debasing or enslaving us is something that we have to as like a, as a categorical, as a categorical imperative, right? Like in our, you know, coding, um, we have to be challenging, um, you know, these, these, these systems. Right. And again, I think it's it's worthwhile to note too, like this does come out of uh, you know the the kind of radical uh, moment that you have when you do realize that it's like no, you know, there is not uh, an author of of this universe and of our societies, and in fact, it is us um, as as humankind, and then that makes it us much more responsible um, for for the fates of not just ourselves but each other um, than something else, right? Because you know, this is obviously it's it's a collective philosophy too, rather than just an individual uh, one. Yeah, a little bit more on uh, the Reformation here has a I specifically yeah. practical significance for Germany. Germany's revolutionary past is particularly theoretical. It is the Reformation. Then it was the monk, and now it is the philosopher in whose brain the revolution begins. Luther vanquished servility based upon devotion because he replaced it by servility based upon conviction. He shattered faith in authority because he restored the authority of faith. He transformed parsons into laymen because he transformed laymen into parsons. He liberated men from outward religiosity because he made religiosity an inward affair of the heart. Mm -hmm. He emancipated the body from chains because he laid chains upon the heart. But if Protestantism is not the true solution, it was a true formulation of the problem. The question was no longer a struggle between the layman and the parson external to him. It was a struggle with his own inner parson, his parsonic nature. And if the Protestant transformation of German laymen into parsons emancipated the lay popes, the princes, together with their clergy, the privileged and the Philistine, the philosophic transformation of the Parsonic Germans into men will emancipate the people. I just I just love that section where he's going back and forth saying like, you know, you turn the part the lay people into parsons because you turn the the or you the parsons and the lay people you turn the lay people into parsons, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean the democratization of ideas that was uh, a, a, like it was like Marx has a true formulation of the problem, but ultimately you're not getting at the root of it. It's just very, I mean, amazing writing. Um, oh, no doubt. Um, are, are, are we finishing this section or? Um, yeah, I'm going to skip, uh, give... skip now. Okay. Well then, then let me just, you know, for people who might not be familiar though, with that period of time, people know Martin Luther as the guy who is banging, you know, these, 
these mean words outside of the church, right? And 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 breaks from, you know, breaks from the the holy, the the holy church. But later in his life, um, you know, so people think of him as this kind of, kind of radical who was challenging authority. Um, but later in his life, there is this massive peasants' rebellion, um, where they're saying like all of this stuff that you've been telling us about, you know, the you know the excesses of of the greed of of the wealthy and and the powerful and the privileged classes in society. Um, all of these people who are saying that they are able to stand for God. Um, we believe you. We believe you, Martin. And we're like ready to stand up and create this kingdom of heaven. And they're standing with um, with Thomas Munzer, who is a you know super radical um, you know preacher as well. All these people are like, yes, we're here. We're ready to do it. And Luther, who at that point, who had found himself in a quite comfortable position. Um, gone were the days when he was a kind of like skinny and scared guy. And he had gone, um, you know, he had... <laughs> He'd been enjoying all those wonderful Bavarian pastries and like the nice life that he had set up himself because he had struck a deal with the German ruling classes, essentially. Um, and he ends up condemning um, this peasant uh, rebellion that was a true, in, in a logical sense, like a true embodiment of like the, the teachings that Luther was was coming up with. Luther ends up condemning it later um, in, in, in his life, right? Um, so that's also what Marx is, is talking about. Like, so again, it was an incomplete um, process. Um, a lot of it was true, um, you know, both in the sense of like the, the philosophical movement from like, uh, you know, yeah, turning thing, these things sort of internally, uh, but also historically too. Like this didn't break that that system. It, it was able to change some things, um, but it did it. It wasn't able to, you know, lift up like the weight of overhauling the entire system of of like German feudalism and and and, and right. monarchy, even though it had some you know some threatening um, ideas toward it. Yeah. Yeah. So then we move into the final third, uh, talks about how theory becomes realized. How does that happen? Uh, before going into some year on European decay, take some shots at constitutional Germany. And then you do a nice section. We won't get into it, but like you're talking about, um, bourgeois revolutions and how the, yeah. um, bourgeois comes to stand for the whole of society in a time of emancipation, uh, and the, and you know, the obvious problems of that. Um, and, uh, we'll come in at the tail end of that section here. species of egoism which brings into prominence its own limitations. The relation of the various spheres of German society is therefore not dramatic but epic. Each of them begins to be self-conscious and to press its special claims upon the others not when it is itself oppressed but when the conditions of the time, irrespective of its cooperation, create a sociable foundation from which it can, on its part, practice oppression. Even the moral self-esteem of the German middle class is only based on the consciousness of being the general representative of the Philistine mediocrity of all the other classes. Consequently, it is not only the German kings who succeed to the throne mat a propos, but it is every sphere of bourgeois society which experiences its defeat before it celebrates its victory, develops its own handicaps before it overcomes the handicaps which confront it, asserts its own narrow-minded nature before it can assert its generous nature, so that even the opportunity of playing a great part is always past before it actually existed. And each class, so soon as it embarks on a struggle with the class above it, becomes involved in a struggle with the class below it. Consequently, the Princeton finds itself fighting the monarchy. The Th that stuff, I mean, I, I'd be interested to see if somebody treat that section more in depth about like the conditions to become an oppressor uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of discussion. Because that is like, you know, you, we talk about a lot of this, you know, the context of America and the, our historical inheritance and, um, I feel like it doesn't really use that framework um, uh, as much as maybe it should. Bureaucrat finds himself fighting the nobility. The bourgeois finds himself fighting them all, while the proletariat is already commencing to fight the bourgeois. The middle class hardly dares to seize hold of the ideas of emancipation from its own standpoint before the development of social conditions and the progress of political theory 
declare this standpoint to be antiquated, or at least very problematical. In France, partial emancipation is the basis of universal emancipation. In Germany, universal emancipation is the conditio sine qua non of every partial emancipation. In France, it is the reality. In Germany, it is the impossibility of gradual emancipation, which must bring forth entire freedom. In France, every popular class is tinged with political idealism, and does not feel primarily as a particular class, but as the representative of social needs generally. The role of emancipator, therefore. Flits from one class to another of the French people in a dramatic movement, until it eventually reaches the class which will no longer realize social freedom upon the basis of certain conditions lying outside of mankind and yet created by human society, but will rather organize all the conditions of human existence upon the basis of social freedom. In Germany, on the other hand, where practical life is as unintellectual as intellectual life is unpractical. No class of bourgeois society either feels the need or possesses the capacity for emancipation. It's funny, like the f- America really seems to take that France role of like the, we're mm. the emancipators and we're like way ahead of everybody, right? Like it's funny to see people looking at other countries like France as that, but obviously you know the French Revolution had its uh, had a big impact. <laughs> yeah, <Europe>. exactly. <laughs> unless driven thereto by its immediate position, by material necessity, by its chains themselves. Wherein, therefore, lies the positive possibility of German emancipation? Answer. In the formation of a class in radical chains, a class which finds itself in bourgeois society, but which is not of it, an order which shall break up all orders, a sphere which possesses a universal character by virtue of its universal suffering, which lays claim to no special right, because no particular wrong but wrong in general is committed upon it, Mm. which can no longer invoke a historical title but only a human title, which stands not in a one-sided antagonism to the consequences but in a many-sided antagonism to the assumptions of the German community. A sphere, finally, which cannot emancipate itself without emancipating all the other spheres of society, which represents, in a word, the complete loss of mankind, and can therefore only redeem itself through the complete redemption of mankind. The dissolution of society, reduced to a special order, is the proletariat. The proletariat... um, this, I mean, this, you know, for people who are, because we played a lot, a good amount of text, I mean, um, yeah, of the text just then, you know, essentially what Marx is going through is is, is breaking down how in, in France and in Germany, um, you know, there there do exist uh, classes to some extent, um, but they're they're different in their own ways. And um, in, in, in certain ways, because of the conditions under Germany, um, they're not really able to to pursue some kind of grand emancipation where in France, um, because of like the revolution and, and, and the conditions there, uh, people have sort of moved on at least of, you know, the kind of larger classes like the bourgeoisie, the nobility, the, the priest class um, from really even thinking, cause everyone's talking in, in terms of universality for all of these rights. Um, they've sort of moved on from this period of, of considering themselves members of, of, of this class, even though that some of them might actually have the ability, um, you know, uh, which, which doesn't exist in Germany to like sort of force this emancipation. Essentially the, you know, too long didn't read version of that. Um, what he's saying is that like, despite all of these different historical and cultural conditions that are leading to this, um, you know, lack of, of a radical rupture in, in these two societies, um, despite the fact that they're all particular in their own way, um, there is this kind of general similarity because none of these classes um, in and of themselves are opposed to the entirety of the mm-hmm. system. Um, 
compare that to the proletariat where the only way for the proletariat to emancipate themselves, the only way for the working class to emancipate themselves is to destroy the very conditions themselves that that designate them as the working class, right? And that is that is wage labor and that is private property. So this is this is a very important bit in, in Marx's writing here, where he's he's putting his finger on this rising class. Remember, you know, this is you know a, a moment of rapid but still new industrialization, right? Seeing that this new class is being created, which is different, um, you know, from for example, like there's always been people at the bottom of society. There have been peasants. And, and slaves, right? There, like the, the 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 development of the proletariat is extremely notable on on world historical terms, but not just because oh, there's an underclass in society. Again, like this is not something that is is unique to capitalism, um, but uh, the the radical aspect of 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 the proletariat is because of their location um, in production mirrors their location in class society, their emancipation. Um, uh, from from you know where they are at requires um, them to overthrow uh, that that entire that entire system, right? So here you're seeing like this kind of yeah, it's just like a very radical moment where like there actually is a class that has such a coherent interest, might not have the understanding or the capabilities currently um, to to overthrow the system, but this is unique um, compared to even the more powerful classes um, in, in in history. Yeah. It just reminds me of um, Jen Psaki today talking about how if you're upset about um, nothing getting passed, uh, yeah. go kickboxing and take margaritas. Um, and that, that just the line of p- people living among the proletariat, living among the bourgeois, but not being part of the bourgeois. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's like a completely foreign concept to a lot of folks. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, it, at least like in the sense of like that that kind of culture, <laughs> like why mom culture, right? This special exactly. Uh, Got to uh, we'll finish off the last uh, couple minutes of this. Uh, I think that sounds great. Uh, introduction here. The dissolution of society, reduced to a special order, is the proletariat. The proletariat arises in Germany only with the beginning of the industrial movement. For it is not poverty resulting from natural circumstances, but poverty artificially created. Not the masses who are held down by the weight of the social system, but the multitude released by the acute breakup of society, especially of the middle class, which gives rise to the proletariat. When the proletariat really proclaimed, yeah. um, it, it's just it's worth noting here what the the con- this is the fundamental contradiction of capitalism. Um, that he's noting, it's like in this moment where we are now producing more and our capabilities of producing have never been higher, we are now seeing higher levels of impoverishment, higher levels of, of suffering for people, right? Um, despite the fact that our technology and our capabilities have increased, this social order is even worse in some ways um, from what we have come out of, right? And this really is something that motivates and, and, and frightens Marx a lot. I mean, it's such a it's such a revealing debate and a revelatory about economics that it's still unclear and probably I would just say not tr- the case that the British Industrial Revolution was good for the <laughs> average labor, right? Like, I think it's pretty mm-hmm. clear that that wasn't. And it's just, uh, yeah. I mean, it, we live at an interesting time where like, I remember sort of um, through osmosis getting that industrial revolution sort of like myth, right? Like that, oh mm-hmm. my gosh, it's basically everything is, everything's better. Um, and uh, and no, actually certain people it was actually pretty difficult for well, and uh, on the backs of a lot of people. And, and again, we're seeing these similar kind of conditions happening now where like we have like incredible capabilities. Like I can drive to the store as like, uh, who's that idiot at uh, the Washington Post? Um, I can't remember, the libertarian writer. Um, oh, yeah. Molly something I can't remember it right now it doesn't matter but she always likes to be like oh well you're you're living much better than kings did because you can have <laughs> strawberries whenever you want them um, yeah. and, and it's like well okay well let's look at what's happening with um, <laughs> look at what's happening with life expectancy for people in our generation right like um, this is like we we live in a world of abundance abundance created by the labor of, of the toiling uh, classes um, and, and as much as they keep saying like one day we're going to reach this mountaintop of, you know, just kind of shared prosperity for all, 
uh, we don't uh, we don't seem to cross over that threshold. Um, yeah. Right, I mean, and it's like this it's is like recently it, as the nineties. You had of our ability, though. I'm sorry, like it's in spite yeah. of our incredible technological abilities that, like, within them, have the radical potential of having a society where people um, aren't going without, like. Uh, like have the potential of a situation where everybody is thriving. Right. So of course, like, you know, like things have, have progressed in, in, in many ways. And that's something to celebrate. Um, one, cause that came from our labor. Um, but the fundamental contradiction has, has not shifted that despite our growing capacities uh, to provide more and more, um, you know, for ourselves through technology and, and labor and, you know, and, and all of that, um, Life for a lot of people is is continuing um, to get worse, or if, if anything, is just completely decoupled um, from what our capabilities or capacities are. Not to mention the people who on the bottom of the imperial boot, um, you know, whose whose lives are, are certainly shortened um, to maintain the, that system. Yeah, I have this uh, here. Let's see. Let me just pull pull this up to the. Uh, uh, this and is that's, George. That's going boomer. George H. W. Bush here. Um, <laughs> Remember the peace dividend? Hold on, uh, I'm pulling it. I'm making you larger so people can see. And thus ensure the credibility of our deterrent. Some will say that these initiatives call for a budget windfall for domestic programs. But the peace dividend I seek is not measured in dollars. Yeah, and it wasn't uh, because it didn't exist. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, and I remember that, like, right? The Cold War is over. Everyone, let's do healthcare shit. What can we do with all of that money we're not spending on, you know, um, preparing to uh, nuke the entire world to stop communism? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, of course, nothing changed. In fact, uh, neoliberalism just continued to pace. Wages continued stagnating. Uh, but Bill got in there. Um, <laughs> yeah. The peace dividend. ...of the middle class, which gives rise to the proletariat. When the proletariat proclaims the dissolution of the existing order of things, it is merely announcing the secret of its own existence, for it is in itself the virtual dissolution of this order of things. When the proletariat desires the negation of private property, it is merely elevating to a general principle of society what it already involuntarily embodies in itself as the negative product of society. With respect to the nascent world, the proletariat finds itself in the same position as the German king occupies with respect to the departed world, when he calls the people his people, just as he calls a horse his horse. In declaring the people to be his private property, the king acknowledges that private property is king. Just as philosophy finds in the proletariat its material weapons, so the proletariat finds in philosophy its intellectual weapons. And as soon as the lightning of thought has penetrated into the flaccid popular soil, the elevation of Germans into men will be accomplished. Let us summarize the result at which we have arrived. The only liberation of Germany that is practical or possible is a liberation from the standpoint of the theory that declares man to be the supreme being of mankind. In Germany, emancipation from the Middle Ages can only be effected by means of emancipation from the results of a partial freedom from the Middle Ages. In Germany, no brand of serfdom can be extirpated without extirpating every kind of serfdom. Fundamental Germany cannot be revolutionized without a revolution in its basis. The emancipation of Germans is the emancipation of mankind. The head of this emancipation is philosophy. Its heart is the proletariat. Philosophy cannot be realized without the abolition of the proletariat. The proletariat cannot abolish itself without realizing philosophy. When all the inner conditions are fulfilled, the German day of resurrection will be announced by the crowing of the Gallic cock. <laughs> now, I gotta say, like the uh, the stuff at the end kind of loses me a little bit. Um, I, I don't quite have the agility of mind to follow some of that, but uh, the Gallic cock thing is a good imagery to end with. Do you know that? Could no. you explain that for folks? The Gallic I, cock. I don't. 
Do you know? Oh, it's. I mean, I only know in the sense of the, that it's the symbol of the uh, of of the French Revolution, the radical. French oh, I didn't Revolution. know that. Yeah, um, and I, I can't remember what they had before, but yeah. So it, it like has like the embodies the spirit of like the Republic. So he's you know he's seeing this as a continuation, um, as as many people did, um, you know of 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 these ideas. Um, yeah, I mean, the the last paragraph. Um, is a little tough and I won't be able to explain all of it. I will say that there's, um, uh, there's, um, Hegelian terminology in, in brackets throughout that entire section. So he's working right. through, uh, you know, a kind of logic system that might be foreign. I just don't think it's worth like breaking all that down. But the point here, um, at least towards the end is that, um, these things, philosophy, because remember, he's this is his crit, critique um, of Hegel um, and, and the, the Hegelians by extension here. And this is the introduction to it. So what he's saying to them is like their higher, you know, their conceptions of like the importance of ideas sort of like bringing us out of this. Um, he is saying that like, no, like this is not going to be possible um, without this kind of material class struggle. So to, to realize the thing that you say that you want so badly, um, you need to come back um, to earth, right? You need to come back to these social struggles um, that, that we're seeing in us and understanding um, that like, again, if you want to create this rational world where we can eradicate these, these um, ancient ideas, um, these, um, you know, that, that we have in German society, you need to like commit yourself um, to the radical, social social struggle um and that 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 will have to be with the proletariat um which is again quite the radical move i mean you know we we're familiar with it at this point i mean regardless of the fact that we grew up in the united states like the conception of of like socialism as like the movement of, of like the people against the the old order um it's just something we've we we've known about right um but it's it's quite quite a radical claim here um, that, you know, this needs to come from these working class people and yeah. uh, not from these really smart boys, these fancy lads hanging out, um, you know, with all the young Hegelians. And it's I, it's such a baller move to put this in, like, like I said, like a yeah, critique, <laughs> like it, it sounds so philosophical, right? But this is really mm -hmm. just you, you can almost forget about Hegel reading this, right? Like it's just like <laughs> yeah. a, uh, like a, a political uh, pamphlet, you know, to know the conditions of censorship, it's, I, I think it's inspiring. And, you know, I mean, no, I mean, it's a, it's a really fascinating text and maybe one day, and honestly, this is one of those things where I think maybe having a guest on to help us break through all of this because, you know, it's been a long time. But this is where Althusser um, gets very interesting with, with Marx because one of the claims, um, if you ever heard like the young and old Marx, um, conception. I don't know how from if you're familiar with that. Um, I'm not super familiar. So basically, like Althusser makes the argument that in, in Marx there is a, a radical rupture when he becomes, um, you know, the old Marx who is like a materialist versus the idealist Marx, um, and these texts sort of begin to show that that rupture, but it's not complete here. Um, but it becomes a big tension, and you know, I'm just saying this is like an important debate within like the theory of, you know, ideas and, and like Marxist philosophy. Um, but Althusser's conception is that there's too much of, of Hegel in, in young Marx, even when he's trying to break from him. Um, and you mm. can see it again, like I'm not a Hegel expert, but you can see it even in that text that like, he is still trying to work through some of these, like these, these models and, 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 and these ideas. And in a lot of ways, correcting them as, as Althusser, I, I think is the one who said standing, um, Hegel on his head um but uh you know anyways it's like it is it is very notable that like even though Marx like because Marx was like this was these were his boys you know what I mean like this is like how he was thinking about the world these were the people who were instructing him on things mm -hmm. and he has this radical um break as he starts to see what's happening um you know in in society as he's starting to see the development of these classes when he starts to see what's going on uh, with the proletariat and and particularly um, with the, the rise of, of private property as something that, yes, it certainly breaks the ancient rights of, of the princes and, and lords and, um, you know, their equivalents in, in Germany. Um, but it, uh, it, it replaces that with a, a new system, right? And that's the system of, of, of capitalism. So, um, yeah. 
point is that like you know so in the old world it was the in the feudal world it was the bourgeoisie the rising classes that were a challenge um to the absurdity of the idea that like because you have you know a long pedigree you have some divine right over the land and the people living in it right i mean that was a radical rupture and when we're talking about emancipation i mean it is correct to use that word in in that sense and when marx is talking about this emancipation of like these classes like the bourgeoisie tries to emancipate um, society from its more absurd and backwards um, nature. But, um, you know, once it does it and it has the power, it quickly forgets itself um, as in, in this role. And this is why he puts so much hope in the proletariat, because it's just like, even he, he you know, basically with his argument, it's just like, even if they don't, like, even if they do the same thing that every other class has done in history, where they come into power and they sort of, um, lose themselves in this moment just because of the very nature of what they will have to do to come into power. It, it will create, um, you know, uh, it will eradicate the, uh, you know, these old forms, this, the spiritual forms and like the feudal forms from society. Yeah. And a lot of this is driven home and on the, on the Jewish question too, mm -hmm. um, which uh, the, the, sorry, the first part is the part where it's, if the um, uh, Shlomo uh, Avenari says, you know, if that was the only part written, Marx would go down as basically a champion of Jewish civil rights. Um, we'll get into like some of the, you know, the interpretation of the second part, um, you know, in the mm -hmm. second thing. But um, there's also in on the Jewish question some in, in this text, you know, the comparisons between France and Germany seem um, more harsh on German uh, side, but there's a lot of interesting criticism of of France and you know, the limits of their individualistic uh, revolution in, on the Jewish question. But. And also Marx, um, I mean, just, you know, biography wise, like Marx was an internationalist and, and, and a communist and he wanted to see the end of these systems. But um, he was one who was known to be quite proud of like the great achievements of like the high minded Germans. Right. You know, he would get drunk and like argue about, you know, great German classical music and, and philosophy, et cetera. So um, he's a. Uh, even though he might seem he's a little down on, on Germany, he was, <laughs> he was not, I don't know. He was just not some kind of passive um, whiny guy who was just angry at his home. Right. Well, folks, I think uh, that's uh, well, our chronological journey through uh, Marx is, uh, is uh, started with a bang and um, like yeah, looking forward to doing this again um, in a couple weeks or so. Yeah. I mean, these, uh, I like this. Uh, these readings are good. I mean, the, uh, the audio is good. Yeah, it is. All right, folks. All right, see, see you all Tuesday. We got uh, yeah, Marshall Steinbaum talking about student loans. And Bob Lydell, too, mm. who is running for Travis County Commissioner. It'll be a really interesting talk. The guy who's in charge about how much money Elon Musk gets in task, uh, tax breaks, so actually a very important uh, position. Oh, wow. So really looking forward to that, too. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I need to do yeah, we need, to, we need our man on the inside there to take down Elon. As, as, there's a lot of Elon fans that think we actually do have the power. Um, anyway. <laughs> I wish we did. Yeah. Um, folks, see you in, uh, next week.